This is the Pacific as you know it. Wide stretches of water. But this is the Pacific as the Joint Chiefs of Staff view it. A battlefield, a vast fortress-studded plain on which key strongholds anchor a Japanese defense line guarding the heart of the homeland. The American front lines had advanced to Guam and Saipan. Ahead now stood Iwo Jima, the most heavily fortified island in the world. Iwo Jima was hell, out and out hell. And the desperate Japs set the price high in American shot and shell and men. My name is Edward Mortimer Denau. I go by Mort Denau. I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, January 24th, 1918. I started drawing when I was in grade school, about eighth, ninth grade. Got the pleasure of making stick men on the edge of a book and then run it off that way, made it into a movie. So that's what got me interested in drawing. Well, my parents decided to put me into an art school, and I didn't appreciate doing art. I'd rather do it with cartoon work, which I did. I enlisted in the Marine Corps September 17th, 1943. February 19th, 1945, we hit the beach of Iwo Jima. I got very nerve-wracking sitting in a shell hole, just watching ones getting killed and wounded, and it's getting on your nerves. So I decided I'd just write down the logs of what was happening, just get my mind off what was going on. So I'd just bring out my pad and write what happened in that morning or the day before or what. And that was it. Put it back in my pocket. See <laughs> when come to another one. So after the battle was over, and we boarded our ship to go back to Hawaii, where I had maybe about 50 or 60 of them in my pack. When I got to Hawaii, I got all my logs together and tied them in a package and put them, put them in my sea bag. And there they set my sea bag till I got discharged from the Marine Corps. From there, when I got home, I put the package of the log in a shoebox into the closet. Oh, you stick it up in the shelf and there it sits for years. It went from 1946 till present day, over 50 years. One of my kids found the box and was reading it. And said, geez, you should recopy this, Dad. Do it. I kept bugging me and bugging me. Finally, one day, I was looking for something in the closet, and I ran across it, and I started reading it, and I thought, geez, 
So that's when I started putting them together, and I had to, some of them had to be real careful because that paper was real brittle. I was diddling one day, and I drew a picture, and oh crap, I can be better to visualize if I draw a picture with the story. So that's how I got on the drawing. So up to this point, my redrawing and making the recopying, I have over 302 pictures. I was with my friends, we were all teenagers. We were all down at one of my friend's house shooting pool. And I went upstairs to get something out of the refrigerator and I heard that where Pearl Harbor had been bombed. So I come down and told everyone Pearl Harbor just got bombed. And everybody thought, where's Pearl Harbor? A couple of weeks after the Pearl Harbor deal, by then I started losing all my buddies that are going in being enlisted in the service. But I was being deferred because of a widowed mother, and also I worked at the Willow Run Bomber Plant, which deferred me from going into the service. So every six months I had to check in at the board. So this one time I went through the whole rigmarole and they passed me and I told them then that I didn't want to get deferred. I wanted to enlist in the paratroops, army. I told the sergeant of the guard there, who was a Marine, I said, I want to join the Army paratroops. And he looked at me and he said, well, the Army paratroops are filled up and you'll have to wait till your next trip here. And he said, but the Marines have paratroops. Well, I'd heard about the Marines, so I said, well, no, I prefer the Army. Because all my friends are there. But he says, yeah, but you'll be trained in California. And right then, winter coming up, and I get just pictures of California, and I, he kept soft soaping me. And the more he talked, the more he pulled the papers closer to me. Finally, I decided, well, sounds reasonable I can become a paratrooper in the Marines. I signed the papers, and before I could dot the I, he grabbed it and said, now your ass belongs to us. <laughs> and I figured, oh no, I did it. <laughs> I arrived in California, I just got off the train, pouring down rain, and it was supposed to be sunny California. I had to go through six weeks of boot camp. The last day of uh, boot camp. So everybody went to a different place. You took a test and I passed along with about five others and we got in the past to become paratroopers. Exercise and calisthenics and running. That's the way it was through the whole paratroop training. You didn't walk, you continuously was running all the time. If you go to the store or any place, you ran. Well, we know we had one more week on the towers, and uh, then we'd make our first plane jump. We were kind of anxious waiting for that. Saipan had just been invaded by us and won the war of Saipan, so Saipan was ours. Now our next battle coming up they have to have a new division. So it eliminated the paratroops and the Marine Raiders. And we combined together and they sent us to Pendleton to form the 5th Division. I decided I wanted to become the machine gunner on the water cool brownie. It's about a 90 pound weapon. It's usually on a machine gun cart which made it easier to pull it back and forth. And it's water cool, and it's 500 rounds a minute. They test you on the rifle range, 
And I passed the test to become a machine gunner, and that's what I was, a machine gunner. My unit was just go by the nicknames. Stud was Ken. Ski was Solowski. And I was Boomer. After training in Hawaii for another 12 months, we shipped out. We didn't have a clue where we were going. It was just all hearsay and scuttlebutt. Till finally, it was three days before that we actually knew where we were heading in. And there was a little dot on the map called Iwo. The island itself, looking on the map, looked like a big pork shop. It was small on one end and larger on the other. It was 800 miles from Katano Point to Tokyo. It was important because when the planes used to go from Saipan to bomb Tokyo, the Japs on Iwo Jima would attack our bombers as we were heading over to, to Japan. Going along, ships would join us. Each day it'd give you another ship, and another ship. To find when we looked out and we see nothing but on the horizon was ships of all kinds. And we knew it was something big coming up. February 18th, as we were aboard ship heading for Iwo, we noticed our ships at one point had slowed down in their speed. And we could, uh, in the distance, we could hear a rumbling. And someone said that we're only about maybe 20 or 25 miles from Iwo. The Jews, Catholics, and Protestants all had their own section that they'd go and had their last rites and services before we went to battle. We prepared all our equipment, made sure it was in working condition, well-oiled, and ready to go. And I was just getting prepared for the invasion in the morning. Four o'clock in the morning, they woke us up. And we went down for breakfast. And the, they said we could order anything we wanted to eat. They, we'd get it. And said Ski and us, we ordered turkey, which we got. Nice turkey legs. We said, Gee, well, this is the last food we're going to get like this. We might as well store up on it. And we went around to others who weren't eating their turkey. They were just sitting there, staring into space, figuring what's going on, and they lost their appetites. So they gave us their turkeys, and we packed them away in wax paper, and in battle, we had turkey. From there, then, we went up on deck, and I was in the third wave, so we seen the other two waves going. Well, there was so much dust and smoke that you could see them slowly disappearing into a cloud of smoke. There was all this airplanes dropping bombs, and artillery coming off of the ships, and it was one hell of a noisy place. You had to go over the side of the rail on a cargo net, and that's pretty tricky if the water is rough because the ship is going up and down and you're trying to get down this rope ladder like net. Well, as I was going down, it was a 10-foot wave, so that means that boat was 10 feet up down and then comes back up. The minute I felt it touch my feet, I did my swing that I was supposed to do, but my shovel, the handle of the shovel got caught in the net and left me hanging there when it went down. Then the ship come back up and thank heaven that it unhooked me and I got off of it. A few bumps and scrapes, but I got off okay. Well, after I dropped into the boat off the net and I got myself positioned right, and we took away from the ship and headed for the beach. And all you hear is the roar of the motor and all the exploding shells. Every now and then you'd get dosed like with the buckets of water on you. It was shells that were hitting close to the ship or the boat. 
I looked over the edge of the Higgins boat, and I could see water spouts from the Japs artillery. Every now and then you'd see a boat being blown. Men and all exploded, and boat wiped right out. Then you start noticing that you're in trouble. Well, they wasn't scared. It was just that you were numb of knowing what was going on. It was just like a bad dream. You couldn't believe it. I thought we'd never get there. It must have took from the ship to there a good 15 minutes, 20 minutes. They we're getting closer. This coxman is a Navy personnel. I was driving the Higgins boat. He kept telling us we're getting closer, we're getting closer, keep down. When I dropped the ramp, get the hell out of here fast. That's all he said was, have good luck. And then when we did come in, we didn't get him right up on the beach like it should. Because of the dead bodies, he couldn't get this Higgins boat over all these dead bodies, so he just dropped us off there. They just dropped the ramp and we were in about knee deep water. Cold, but you didn't, that wasn't on your mind. It could have been ice and we wouldn't have known it. But you still had to walk over dead bodies floating around all, it was nothing but just dead bodies that you were in. Each time they'd come in, they'd knock out different Higgin boats and they were just in the way. Well, when you drop off a ramp and it's knee deep, it's hard to maneuver, especially when you get a machine gun cart to carry and pull. There's a bicycle, like bicycle wheels on it, and it's sunk right into the sand. And besides, you were running over, stepping over, and tripping over dead bodies floating in the water. And then when you get on shore, it was the same way all the way. There was no, no cover. You just go from the hanging boats to the beach to the bluffs, which was black sand. There was really a mess of sand. Just like walking in snow. You couldn't get good gripping. It was very gritty. It was getting into your shoes, getting in all your equipment. Well, all the sergeant kept hollering his head for the bluff, get up on them bluffs, get to the top. Because you'd hit that sandy bluff that was about 20, 25 foot high. You'd go up three feet and slide back two feet. And the Japs was just pouring the artillery and mortars in on us and we're trying to get up that sand. And that's where we lost most of our men was on the beach. I'd say it seemed like we were never going to reach the top, but when we finally got to the top, it was a relief. Only just for a few minutes, because then you had ground gun fire on top as you are going in. It was worse than trying to get up the sand. They were flying from everywhere. You had machine gun, you had artillery, artillery and mortar shells dropping in all among you. And you just kept seeing guys get blown up or falling and falling backwards. And all you see them when you look back was just dead bodies in the sand and down the beach. So we had to go across the whole base of the island. All you could hear was bullets crashing and mortar shells going all around us, so yeah, it was slow moving. So it got towards evening, and we thought, my God, we gotta go through a night now. And so we picked out a nice big shell hole. We figured we could all get into that shell hole for the night. So we got in there, we started shells going, as we're digging and getting chunks of sandstone and throwing out. This one guy said, geez, I hit an old can or something over here. I'll just build around it, we said, with the sandstone. And we piled it on it and went around and around. The next morning we found out the tin can wasn't a tin can. It was a 16-inch artillery shell, dead. And they're very dangerous. Sometimes they'd go off with just a slight shock, and we were piling rocks on it. Well, that scared the hell out of us. We got the hell out of that hole as fast as we could without making even a vibration. So as we got out and got in the shell hole, we seen some demolition guys with told there's a shell in that hole over there, so they went over and blew it. If that thing would have went off, it would have wiped the whole six of us right out of that hole like it was nothing. Well, Iwo is a big volcanic island that was formed by a volcano. 
But for 20 years, the Japs had been digging tunnels. The place was just a big anthill of tunnels and caves. And once we got past the bluff from the hitting the beach, we were on the level ground that we thought. And as we advanced, we'd run into this pocket of Japs, and we'd all get down fighting, and we're fighting that way. And the next moment, we know we're getting hit from behind. It's the same damn bunch of guys. We didn't know that that island was a honeycomb nand handle. Just nothing but tunneled underneath us. It was the 28th Marines. They cut off from us when we were starting to cross that isthmus, and they headed for Surawachi. And we were heading then up to the side of the West Beach. And well, we were doing our fighting, and they were having a hell of a time getting to the top of that Surabachi. Finally, when we were down below, we were fighting with the, had our machine guns going like mad down there. Someone said, hey, there's a flag going up on the Surabachi. So quickly we looked back and seen it. We said, well, good, they finally got to the top. Now they can come down and help us. And as we're fighting our way over the other side, moving very slowly, someone hollered back, the flag is down. And we looked back and we thought, oh crap, now with them Japs probably got overpowered them. We didn't know what was happening, but we were still having a hell of a time down below us. They were fighting as we're moving. And the guy said, hey, the flag is back up again. I said, what in the hell are they doing out there? We're getting ourselves shot down here, and they're up there playing with the flag. And then they were standing around taking pictures, and, and we're getting hell shot out of us. After the battle was over and we were aboard ship, heading for Hawaii again, why we noticed that the big hell of blue about uh, these six Marines that put the flag up. And then they showed the pictures, and then we realized we sat there watching history being made, and we were bitching about it. Instead of a shrapnel grenade, Jets used a concussion grenade. They'd knock you out so that you were groggy, and then they could hack you up with a Samari sword. It's more honor to kill you with a sword than it would be with a rifle. Artillery is a wicked weapon. It can explode 20 or 50, maybe 100 feet from you, and you'd still you'd get shrapnel from it. The concussion does more damage to you than the damn shell or the shrapnel. I can remember lying there on the ground you happen to look down and see an ant going by, and you say, boy, I wish I was as small as you were right now. The minute they heard that whistle, coming an hour, it's whistling really, and geez, everybody dropped what they were doing, or else they were in a hole, they were trying to get that hole deeper. It uh, that was about the only rocket they had on that island. We called it the Whistling Willie. It, everybody had a different nickname for it. Rocket trucks had come in with, with maybe 100, 200 rockets on them. And they'd get behind us and shoot over our heads into the Jap territory, and a lot of times, nine out of 10, one of those rockets or two of them would land right into our lines, misfire. Oh, that would happen a lot of times, friendly fire. So we got so we didn't really like to see them behind us. All that lead and bullets going, there's always something landing next to you. You can see it kick up the ground. It's either a straight bullet or a piece of shrapnel. Well, one guy got up hollering to his guys to get out of that hole and go over to someplace else, and as his mouth was open hollering, a sniper fires, and the bullet went through both his cheeks without breaking a tooth in his mouth. We call them dimples because 
that left two big dimple marks in his face. But that's all that happened to him. He was just lucky he had his mouth open. The place was just a big anthill of tunnels and caves. Oh, you had to be on the alert at all times when you went across these mouths and caves because you never knew when they'd come charging out at you or else stand there and come out and shoot. If you didn't have a grenade or anything on you to toss in there, well, you, you ran as fast as you could across these mouth caves because you knew there was somebody behind there with a rifle. We used to toss grenades in if it was a, like a big wide opening. Just toss a couple of grenades and then you run across while they're shook up with that grenade sizzling in there. And then we come into this one big ravine and it was all just caves on all sides of it. And there was no way we could get through that ravine. So they called back for a tank to come up, a flamethrowing tank. So this tank driver that he was going to spray the whole area with napalm and let it soak in the ground. And then when he gives a signal, I had to open my machine gun open with tracer bullets. And it was just one big whoomp. And everything was on fire in there. All you seen was human beings running around on fire. Roasted them. Well, you smell human flesh burning just a little bit was bad enough, but when you get into a ravine like that one there, old oh, gags you. It, it just turns your stomach. A flamethrower is a great one to have come help you. And if they shoot in a cave or anything, it goes right into any crack and it soaks in. And that whole uh, cave would explode, and then the Japs would come running out all on fire because they'd catch them. If they had bullets in their pocket as they're running, they'd be exploding and that fire all out. There's one bad draw that a flamethrower has of tanks on his back. Well, when a Jap sniper put a bullet through a tank, Flamethrower's tanks, the tanks usually exploded on his back, soaking him in that napalm. He's still alive in a ball of fire and he's running around, burning to death. Bad. The Japs would uh, give you a lull once in a while. They were probably figuring to build up for another attack or something. Well, I gave you time to pick up your dead, put them in different spots, and then they'd come along and pick them up later. And it wasn't then until I ran across one of my best buddies. I wouldn't know him except for his name, A.B. Cowan. So I was one of my buddies that I was stacking on the pile to take back kind of took the starch out of me for the rest of the day. So that's what happened to many other guys. They'd find their best friends, even their own brothers and cousins or something. As we were going from shell hole to shell hole, we noticed that the ground was getting a little warm when you, after you're in it for a while. And it was warm, it was a volcanic sand and you didn't sit in one position very long before it got a little too hot so you had to keep moving if you went down certain depths if you went over six inches you could dig a hole and you can have a hot meal in fact it was a kind of a joke well you had a, a can of like spam or something like that Just a couple of guys tried it and said hey it is right it cooks up a good meal enough for us advancing, we spotted this one open space. I mean, there was no rocks or nothing to protect it, just an open space. So we started through, and that's where the Japs waited till we got in so far, and then they opened fire on us. 
And when we hit the ground, we knew the Japs had suckered us into a trap like, because it was too hot to lay on the ground and get burnt. So we had to roll over on our backpacks and our shoes. It's the only way you kept from getting burnt, but they were firing at us. So finally somebody radioed back and brought a tank up and the tank then got us out of there. And we ran into these CBs. They were really a different brand of pure person. They were something else. Right behind us as we were fighting, they were building a two-lane highway. They were working just like they were a civilian on a road. They were the craziest guys. They did a good job. Stud and I went back to and skied to get some uh, ammo. And uh, on our way back, we ran into some spam that was in the CP. So we each grabbed a can of spam. And instead of coming back the same route we took, we come back a shortcut that Stud said he knew about. So we took the shortcut and got to our fox wall. Well, the next morning, these demolition guys was out there working, and they come over and said, don't go through that space over there because it's all mine. We walked through a minefield and didn't know it. As we sat there, after he told us to stay out of there, we'd seen the guys had mines piled up next to them, and they were getting them off. <laughs> Just luckily, we didn't hit a mine. As we were sitting in this one area, this guy come running to get out of the sniper's lane. He jumps in our foxhole, and all of a sudden, one of the guys looked down and went, your foot. And the guy looked, uh, he, he didn't even know it. He'd lost his foot, and he'd been running on just a step. Well, we were, was going from shell hole to shell hole, and the Japs used to line each shell hole with mines because they knew we always were jumping into them for protection. And this one guy jumps into this foxhole, and when he did, from his hips down, he was gone. It just blew him away. I got in the foxhole with him, and he kept telling me that his legs hurt. And I said, well, yeah, they should hurt. He had a little wound. And then he was satisfied with that, but uh, he lasted maybe five, 10 minutes. The corps men were usually conscientious objectors. So they never carried a weapon. All they did is take care of the wounded. They were a real brave bunch of guys. According to the rules of war, when you see a Red Cross, you don't shoot that person because they're not fighters. They're to help the wounded, no matter who it is. Well, the Japs didn't, they'd shoot them. They used to get pleasure in shooting a red, red cross. I've seen them guys go into some of the damnedest places I wouldn't even think of going in to get a guy out. With all the, the manpower and all that shelling going on, and all that shrapnel and lead flying through the air, that battlefield is nothing but just Parts of bodies, name it, it's there. Feet, hands, inwards. You see that every day. It's not a pretty sight. I was coming to a sniper lane. And those sniper lanes are a distance of maybe 20 or 30 feet you have to go across. And the sniper has that set up, and he, he can pick you off real easy. Ski and stud had already been across, and they were behind a big boulder. They were hollering for me to come next. And I started off running. I got my feet all tangled up in my feet. I don't know what happened or something. But I tripped and fell. Just as I fell, I heard the crack of a rifle. We well, must have fired, but I missed. But when I hit the ground, I didn't move. I just laid there for a while. Figured he'd maybe figure out if he got hit. And I 
figured I slowly was getting my hands underneath me so I could push up and run. And just as I pushed up to run, he, he fired and the bullet hit the dirt, kicked it all up in my face. And I couldn't see, I had sand in my eyes. And I'm running, but I don't know where I'm going. And the stud and ski are hollering, I'm going by their voice. They were hollering, keep going, you're going to be in a, right by a boulder. Keep running, you're going to hit a boulder, you're going to hit a boulder. Well, I hit it all right, my shins. I went right over and I just landed on something soft, and I thought, oh boy. But they said, don't get up, stay down as low as you can get. And as I'm clearing my eyes and getting out, I noticed a whole bunch of maggots and that, and I thought, I'm right late, I landed on a dead jab that had been full of maggots. And I had to stay right on that bugger so I could get to the next guy come through and he fired and then I can get out. You get a weird sense of humor in battle. This one day I was pulled up next to a shell hole and a guy, he was busy digging a foxhole and he was hollering to me to come and give him a hand. Come on, give me a hand. And I haven't seen a hand laying there and I don't wait that joker says, he wants a hand. <laughs> so he says, come on, give us a hand. I said, what do you want, right or left? He says, don't be funny, give me a hand. I said, well, here you go. <laughs> and he got out of the hole, wouldn't go back in it again. <laughs> As we're going along the western beach, well, we came out to this one place, there was a lot of shell holes, so we dove into them. And it was just full of, uh, old pieces of caskets, skeletons, and, and we couldn't figure out what the heck was going on here. It was an old Jap cemetery that they had up there, that their artillery had blown right out of the ground. And while we didn't like the idea of being around skeletons in our foxholes, no matter where he's dug here, it, it was bones. One of the greatest tricks that Jabs used to pull is having the sun behind them so that we'd have to look in against the sun to try to shoot them. And when you, you can't see them, kind of the brightness of the sun. Well, I had the last watch, which is early in the morning. The sun was just rising. And I was sitting there cleaning out in 45. I was wiping it off, getting the sand off of it and that watching the train, and I could hear pitter-patter, a foot running. And I looked over my shoulder before I couldn't get a rifle out, so I grabbed my 45 and I swung around and caught him at the 45. And when you get hit that close to the 45, it kicks you back about eight feet. Well, if you had a Jap that cornered, all you did is point to your rifle or a knife and tell him which one, and they'd pick the knife. He'd commit Harry Kelly rather than be shot by us. I don't know how they can do it. They just they pick up their knife and they stick it in their stomach, and then they'd slice up, and then they go turn it and go over to the side, take the knife, and then hand it back to you and then it flew over. Call Harry Carey. As we used to say is Harry Carey, and then they carried Harry. The orange supposed to be fooling with uh, souvenirs. Some of the guys are so loaded down with souvenirs, you couldn't tell whether he was a Jap or a Marine. The Japs knew that we were suckers for collecting souvenirs put a beautiful sword out there or something, and they'd booby trap a lot of them. So it was a no-no, but everybody did it. <laughs> well, we were in that hot volcanic area with the ground being hot. My shoes wore out. My soles started coming off my shoes. And I wear a size seven shoe. Mostly your common Marine wears eight and nine. So I had a hard time finding shoes on 
dead Marines you looked for. I was looking for a size, my size shoe. Finally, I spotted this dead Jap. And boy, he had a nice pair of boots. I took his boots, put them on, and they were the most comfortable shoe I've ever had. So as I was wearing them, we came to this one section where we had to go up this hill and go around, and there was honeycomb with cave entrances. And I was in the lead, so these guys kept saying, go ahead, keep going, there's fresh, fresh jet tracks here. You must be up ahead someplace, let's follow them. And I kept saying, there's no Jap prints. And they said, yeah, keep going. They kept pushing me. I said, there's no prints up here. I was making the prints of the Jap shoes. <laughs> well, we had slept overnight in a shell hole we dug out the previous evening. And we had just got these new recruits in that replaced the ones that we lost. And I reached in my backpack and I still had a can of Spam. So I figured, well, I might as well eat breakfast now and get it over with. So just as I was getting ready to open the can of Spam and the orders came down the line where to move out. We, I put my can of Spam, I just tossed it over the side of the foxhole. We only went about 15 feet and them Japs nailed us just pinned us down, we couldn't move. We were all behind big boulders. And these new guys were kind of nervous. They'd jump every time a boulder to hit the ground or anything. So I told them, as long as you're behind this big rock, they can't get you. And they still wanted to go back to the foxhole. I said, okay, go ahead. But time it. When the next time he fires a bullet, you got 15 seconds to get over to that hole. So they finally all got back in the hole. And I was up there behind this boulder by myself. And then I thought, well, damn, I got my can of Spam back there. So <laughs> next time he fired or something, I went back to the hole. And spam is over here. And all these guys are here, and I'm over here. And I spot my can of Spam, and I start crawling across my hands and knees to get it. Just to get over to the can of spam to reach to get it, the whole hole exploded. The mortar cell landed right in our hole. Well, I thought a truck hit me. That explosion just went up and took the pack off my back and it slammed my mouth shut and it cracked all my teeth. This hairline crack. The foxhole was full of dust. I couldn't see. I was, my ears was ringing. I was just all shook up. And I looked and I could see the guys were still sitting cross-legged. And as the smoke was clearing, there was no tops on them. They were all blown in half. So skiing them, they spotted my hole had been blown, so they come running over and they, they took me back up into their foxhole. I get up there and then this Huggins he seen me and he, he cracked up right there. So they had him to contend with and me, <laughs> and they had the old time. So they got a corpsman over there and they were gonna send me back to the hospital. I wouldn't go back. I told them I'm not going back, I won't go back. Well, from then on, I didn't know what was going on for three, about three days. I didn't, I didn't know where my gun was, my machine gun or nothing. And then finally I could start hearing and I got my gun back from one of the guys. I was back in business again. <laughs> well, after going through all that, then I realized that the can of Spam was what saved my life. Sun was getting ready to go down while we moved into this one section. And there was no protection around. We were out in the wide open space. So we figured, how are we going to protect ourselves? So we come up with the idea we had these flare grenades. They're like a grenade, only they're a flare grenade. They light up the area. So we figured we'd put, hook them up with a string we had, and all around the hole, around the perimeter of the hole, 
And anybody had tripped that spring, why, it'd light up everything, and we'd could see who's sneaking up on us. And we got all set up right in about midnight. All of a sudden, pooey, the damn thing goes off. And we think it's jammed hoist, and we were getting ready to shoot, and here's one of our clumsy footed Marines come stumbling in there and set the thing off. <laughs> Left us out there like sitting ducks. They stayed lit for a good 20 minutes. The Jets, I don't know what they were figuring what we were trying to do, but they didn't fire at us. You don't get much sleep in battle. If you can just be going to sleep and now you're bang, something's happening and you gotta go with it. It depends on how busy the Jets kept us going. If they kept us busy all night, well, then the next day you were groggy. We had been fighting all day, jumping in this foxhole, that foxhole, get up and fight, and this and that. Well, as we came into this area, we said this would be the spot, so the rest of the guys started digging. So Studsky and I, we just sit down, put our equipment down on the ground, said we're going to take a little break, you guys keep working, we'll be with you later. So, as we were sitting there, we gradually dozed off to sleep. And the other guys just left us sit up there. Come night and we were still sound asleep. And the next morning as we woke up and there was some dead Japs laying around. There was excitement all around and everybody asked, where were you? <laughs> well, so we fell asleep and they said, my God. That's when the lieutenant come up and he says, the Japs snuck in last night and bayoneted all these different guys. And you're on top of the ground. He said, boy, you guys got a good guardian angel. They figured we were dead, I guess. Well, we'd been fighting all day. We uh, ended up in a big shell hole, which we formed into a foxhole. And we could see Catana Point was only maybe a half a mile from us. So the lieutenant come by and dropped in our foxhole with us and told us, there's our objective sitting right up there in front of us. It's a half a mile. And he says, tomorrow we're going to make our final push. When we take that point tomorrow, the battle will be over. And then Saga said, hey, you still got that flag in your helmet? And I says, yes. I bought it at some drugstore or something. It was only about a foot and a half by two. He said, well, it would look nice sitting up on top of Katana Point there. I said, hey, you're right. I said, well, tomorrow when we take it, we'll hang it up there. He said, no. He said, we're going to do it today. I said, well, that's Jap territory out there. I don't want to, don't, don't worry about the Jap territory. We're going to take that tomorrow, and the Japs know it, so they won't be around. That's what you think. We argued for a good half hour back and forth. You're going to, we're going to do it, I'm not going to do it. You're going to do it, no, we ain't going to do it. So finally I said, okay, we'll go, I'll go with you. So we take off our packs. Picked up a couple of carbines, him and I. I had one and he, and we took clips and we took off. So I told Stud and Skid to keep an eye on it in case something happens, you guys are on the ball with that machine gun. So Saka and I, we make it all the way to the base of the Catano Point and we start up. Well, we started to walk up into the path, it was a real narrow path, only a single file you could go. I didn't like the idea of it because we had to go past these cave openings. And you never knew when it'd be a jet probably hidden in there thinking you're on the edge of a path. So I said, let's, instead of going on the path, we crawl up the side up to the top. So we did. Well, we finally reached the top and it's all bombed out up there. It's got rocks all over the place and tree parts and just sit back and Catch our breath, 
rest a bit. I crawl on my hands and knees over to the side of the top. And while the lieutenant was going on his hands and knees looking for a stick or a pole to put the flag on. So I looked down and there's a ship down there, an old ship rusting out on the beach. It was bombed or torpedoed or whatever. And there's Japs running all around the beach down there. Meantime, Socket is putting together two sticks making a flagpole out of some wire he found. And then we took the little flag out of my helmet, <clears throat> took the shoelace out of my shoe and tied the little flag to the pole. We couldn't dig in the ground because of the hard hardness of it. It was sandstone. So we pick up all these little pieces of rock and we build a parapet around it and put the pole in the base. And then we get the flag is flying, it's up there solid, socket is laying back and he said, you know, looking up at that one, right about now, we should do or say something, shouldn't we? I said, yeah, I'm gonna say one thing, let's get the hell off of here. So we got off, went back down, got back down the ravine, and we get going, and I was all tense all the time, wondering what's gonna happen next. Mm -hmm. Just as I start relaxing, a voice bellers out, halt. Scared the hell out of me. And there was a Marine sitting in among the rocks. I asked us, what in the hell are you guys doing in there? And we said, we just put that flag up there. And he looked up and he said, oh, didn't even see it. Finally, we asked him, where's the 26th Marines, if you knew? And he said, yeah, they're right down there a few hundred yards. We found our gang of guys, made it back to the foxhole safe. The next day, we take the point. And when that, we got into that battle, I kept telling the guy, I said, how in the hell did we get through yesterday without seeing a Jap, and today, my God, it's all nothing but Japs out there. I began to get a creepy feeling. What the hell did we do such a stupid trick? All the battle noise, all of a sudden, everything starts tapering down, tapering down, so it was... Pretty quiet, only shoot shots here and there now and then. Till finally we get the word, cease fire. And the best news we heard in a long time, cease fire. And we kind of set ease back. I'm just thankful that we're still alive, that the battle is finally over. And as we're sitting there for a good half hour, maybe 45 minutes, Someone said, here comes Pollock. The lieutenant colonel was with a group of people. We look up, sure enough, there's a bunch of newsmen, and Pollock is walking with a folded American flag in his arm. And they're heading for the path leading up to Cretano Point. But they stopped dead in their tracks. They were looking up at the point. And they seen our little flag up there. And they turned around and headed back to the CP. And about an hour later, I, all them newsmen and cameramen are looking for a socket and eye. And they finally find their fox hole and jump in and tell us what happened. They went back to the CP, cut the map out, checked it, and found out that we planted our flag on the exact spot they were going to put the official flag. So they decided, after they shot an azimuth and all this and that rigmarole, that was the first flag and they left it up there. But they say the lieutenant colonel was hopping mad. After they jumped in the hole with us, the reporters wanted to get the story of how we did it. Every time they'd ask a question, I'd give them the answer, they'd give their version of it. And that's the way they wrote it. And they asked me where to get the flag. I told them, oh, I bought it at a drugstore. Oh, no, you brought that flag all the way from home for the purpose, you know. I didn't. And I said, well, I bought it. No, you brought it from home. Well, after they got our story, they said that they wanted us to go back up on top of the point to take pictures. They took 16 millimeter movies of it. They took still shots. They kept horsing around, horsing around. I said, this is not, uh, picnic up here. There are snipers down there and they'll pick you off. 
the one photographer was on top there, and all of a sudden you hear, Toom! And he says, Quip, there is Jeff. I said, I'm telling you, there's snipers down there. Let's get this over with and get the hell off of here. Well, on, on Liberty in Hawaii, I stopped in a USO place. It was an army magazine, The Yank. And I, there was an article in there about Iwo Jima. And it was about Socket and I planting the flag on Catano Point. Well, it was something else, because they, they put their own wording in, in the write-up to a volley of sniper fire. There was only one shot fired. <laughs> Later on, after the reporters left, we seen a group of soldiers coming in. And it was U.S. Army. We couldn't figure out what was going on. It was Army boys marching in the area. And then our sergeant came up and told us they was start packing up, we're leaving. The Army's going to do the mop-up job. We formed a line of two, bid the Army goodbye, and we took off down to the five-mile hike we had ahead of us, back to the main CP. As we were aboard the ship, the next morning, radio news come in from the island that the ones that come to replace us up at Catano Point they got pretty lax, thought it was a picnic ground, I guess, and the, the Japs come in at night and damn near wiped them out. What was left of the Japs? Well, the total of Japs was on the island was 27,000. And we got the word that they took only 1,000 prisoners. Stud, Ski, and I was uh, only three that stayed together from the beginning of the paratroops. Most of the Marines lost some of their whole squads of machine gunners. We lost one man out of our squad. Well, we hiked the five miles, arrived at the CP, and the CBs had made a beautiful outfit of hot showers for us. We took our hot showers, was issued all new clothes. After we were issued our new clothes, we were told we could go over to the cemetery and browse around for an hour or so, look for our fallen buddies. They were still working on the cemetery. It kind of tore your morale down and to find some that we didn't know were killed. And they stuck us on ships and shipped us out of there just that fast. So aboard ship and we were leaving while you kind of looked over and thought about leaving all your buddies under those white crosses. And we were watching the island getting smaller and smaller. We seen the big flag on the Suribachi. And then if they had good eyes, you could see the, our flag on the, still up on the, Catano Point. And the island got smaller and smaller, and that was it. Originally, you know, due to your circumstances, you were exempt from the draft. Yeah, I could have got out. Yeah, I could have got out. I didn't have to go. Do you ever have any regrets over no. joining the Marines? No, I'm glad I did. Did you expect to survive when you were fighting there on uh, Evo? You never know. You're just saying to yourself, I hope I see tomorrow. Did you feel lucky? Yeah, very lucky, very lucky. A lot of times. Did you ever wonder why you survived? I have, I've asked that question and how many times. How many of your friends are still alive? Stead's the only one I know of right now. Do you think about your friends over there often? Oh, yeah, especially on the holidays, like Decoration Day and Fourth of July and stuff. Do you um, feel like after having survived this, have you, have you done anything that you would call it heroic? Well, I did my job, and that's what it was, my job, and I did it. <laughs>